Welcome to the talk, everyone. Um, my name's Erica Pinner, curator at the Vitra Design Museum. And those of you who are watching are aware that we're speaking with Sophie Lavelle. Sophie, I'm just going to read a little bit about your bio before we start. Okay. Sophie is a writer, editor, curator, consultant in the fields of architecture, design, and publishing. After moving to Berlin in 1994, she was editor-in-chief and art director of the digital architecture magazine Uncube from 2013 to 2016 and has been the Germany editor of Wallpaper magazine since 2000. From 2012 to 13, she was executive editor of the German design uh, magazine Forum. In 2016, she co-founded the Anne Beyond Publishing Collective with other former members of her Uncube team. Sophie has written various publications and um, she's here today specifically because of her, her monograph, Dieter Rahm's As Little Design as Possible, which was published in 2011. So Sophie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We, um, as everybody who has joined us in the chat knows, we're going to do a film screening of the Dieter, of the film by Gary Huswit um, on Dieter Rahm's. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. And before I forget to mention that at the end, I'll mention that now it's, it's available anytime to watch anytime after this chat in the next 24 hours. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you basically, you can just go to our website, design-museum.de slash YouTube and check it out. So Sophie, your biography says that you moved from the UK to Berlin in 1994. Before we get into talking about Dieter Rams and your experience with him, I'd love to talk about your personal experience as being someone who moved to Germany and specifically Berlin right after reunification, which must have been a fascinating but very crazy time to be there. <laughs> uh, yeah, can you, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it was. I feel incredibly privileged to have been part of a city in transition. Um, it's it's been a great ride, <laughs> really. From I arrived here at working a uh, classic story. I was an artist. Uh, my daughter was really young at the time. Um, I was making machine sculptures. I kind of we hung out with kind of quite an interesting sort of burgeoning crowd of the art scene here or the you know the art gallery scene uh lots of empty spaces to perform and work in and um no money but you didn't need it <laughs> uh that was a time when you get the rents were like cheap or nothing and it was it was great it was a great time and it was quite i started uh, i actually started writing to earn money um because art didn't pay and uh, that's how I ended up bizarrely in the kind of young magazine wallpaper writing for them about architecture. And they said, yeah, sure, you can be our Berlin correspondent. And I thought, well, I'll probably write, you know, like one or two stories about cool GDR buildings, uh, modernist buildings, and then... Um, you know, then I'll run out of things to write and that'll be the end of my career with wallpaper. I mean, so, that's, 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 that's an interesting point because I think like as an outsider, right, you came in with this really fresh perspective of Berlin, I guess. Mm -hmm. Was it something that you found yourself, you know, speaking to colleagues, German colleagues from both parts of Germany, now reunified, and you were kind of more interested in things that for them it was just really blasé or they like design and architecture from the east specifically or was that something that there already was an appreciation for that then um it was it was kind of interesting it was it, it took me a while to kind of get into architecture i don't have an architecture background and and design i kind of fell into it more there there was a big language difference. You know, I really noticed that, that, you know, the kind of um, arriving in Berlin, I really needed to speak German because, you know, the, the former East Germans that I knew didn't, a lot of them didn't speak English. Uh, you know, their second language was Russian. And um, it was really interesting looking at that 
difference between authorship as I started writing. Uh, you know, it, it became, as I learned more about German design and started writing about German design, it was essentially kind of West German design or, and, and the same with architecture. And if I tried to, you know, if I, I would write about a building that was built during GDR times, I would be like looking through what little literature I could find and then, and I kept thinking, well, who's the architect? And then, you know, it, you just get listed this kind of um, basically, you know, a, a, the group of people that built the building without names. It wasn't a, you know, this, this, this kind of making... Wasn't, wasn't the, the star designer kind of quality? That no, kind of not more, at all. It was, yeah. it was a collective effort. And, right. you know, this is still, you know, to this day, though, now they kind of sifted out and you'll get a named architect for something like the television tower. But it was always put down and acknowledged to be a collective effort, which I think back then it was really annoying. But, retros you know, retrospectively, it's, you know, as a writer, it was really annoying. But um, retrospectively, it's so much healthier in a way, mm. with this whole kind of you know, figurehead treatment of people who actually represent collective effort. It's interesting because um, we interviewed uh, Dieter Rams, like a really short interview for the exhibition catalog, which you're going to get soon. You'll be one oh. of the first people to get. Um, but uh, we asked him, you know, like, um, is there anything similar between kind of these collaborative efforts in the GDR with, for example, the teamwork that everybody always talks about at companies like Brown in West Germany? And he adamantly was against that notion. You know, he was like, no, not at all, because in, in Brown or at Brown in West Germany, there was kind of this you had to have the focus on the individual. At the end of the day, like it was a big teamwork but it was a focus on um, kind of entre entrepreneurial spirit, which is something that they didn't have at all in the East. And so he was really adamantly against that. But at the same time, I thought it was interesting because in the preface of your of the book um, mm -hmm. on Rams, you talk about how he was really not interested in having focus on him as kind of this star designer or like another book about him. Do you think that's like, is that really how he sees himself? He doesn't think that he's kind of a big, protagonist star worthy of I think, you know I think it's a bit more complicated than that I'm I, I probably for you know people who know the work of Jonathan I for example I think that would be a really good analogy and that you know I don't know Jonathan I've well at all I've interviewed him a couple of times and he very kindly wrote the intro to my book but he's the chief designer of Apple and or ex chief designer of Apple and um, very, very similar kind of types of personality, I would say. Um, Dieter's incredibly shy, you know, really shy person. But he was, he started at Brown in 1955. They went from, you know, he was an intern and that was the time. So in, in 1949, there was an exhibition with uh, in the States, in New York, a trade fair with German products. And the German products were just slated for being really shitty quality, really bad quality. Um, and then there was this kind of German government drive to kind of improve the quality of the products that were kind of put out on the world market, you know, as part of this recovery program. And, you know, the founding of the German Design Council, the Form for Form. That's for Form Gable. Yeah, form Gable, yeah. <laughs> then. And um, so 1955, and, and Brown was part of that. They That was also when they started their completely new product, product range and showed it for the first time, designed by um, Otto Eichert, Wagenfeld, um, the, the guys from Halfgate Ulm, including Hans Gutschlo. And it wasn't until... Ram, and Rams came in at this time of massive productivity and sudden recognition um, of these products that were completely new and different, and then very quickly became part of the team, and then very quickly again became head of the team at Brown. And I think they realized Brown made him a figurehead. They realized that he was good marketing material. He had this very distinctive look. He was photogenic, he had these great glasses, you know, 
you know, he was a pretty cool dude. He looked great. Um, he took a good photo and they let him be the, you know, they pushed him out and they, they promoted him as the figurehead of their design. Mm. Quite interestingly. Um, and, you know, I, so when you see about, you, you know, you're asking about limelight. Um, I think it was kind of, you know, thrust upon him, but you know, it's the same with anyone. You you also get used to it after a while, and and mm. he spent his entire life since his mid twenties in the limelight, basically. Who were you know? He he's always in everything I've ever read where he does an interview. He always emphasizes the teamwork aspect. So like, mm. there's kind of this interesting dichotomy between yeah, he was totally pushed towards the limelight by those around him. But at the same time, he he kind of likes to to underscore that it was just this big team effort. Who who were those people that were around him that were kind of elevating him to the status that he got, or like who who was like his right hand man? Or uh, I you know I don't I don't think it was like that. I think you know Brown was a kind of relatively big company. It was relatively quickly then bought by Gillette. Um, at the time of this was this big boom was happening and, uh, and, and growth and sales. And so there was also that whole kind of American marketing system that came, you know, that came into play. And um, Dieter was head of the team, was a spokesperson for the team, the same, you know, really similar the way to how Jonathan Ive was spokesperson of the Apple design team. And you never saw the rest of the team. You know, you never, nobody knows who worked in Jonathan Ive's team at Apple. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, very secret. I don't think it was necessarily secret, but it was, it was, you know, the, the, they just said, oh, you know, he's, he's like, you know, the singer of the band. He has to go out there and do the interviews. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I've just read a little bit about the, the brothers, the Brown brothers who kind mm. of, were the ones who changed the company completely and and you had written I think something about how they kind of created this really incredible work working atmosphere so this was also like this was a campus of some kind or they had like you know like a doctor on site and it was really kind of like socially um, advanced like working for Brown at this time um, do you think that that's something that also goes into the work of Dieter Rams, like these kinds of, you know, social need or, or is that a stretch? What would you say? Yeah, no, I think, I think what's, it was a really interesting time. It's after the war, they were very, um, the Brown brothers, very, I think it's philanthropic is the word, you know, they really cared about the people and the working conditions of the people that, you know, the conditions of the people worked for them. They had dentist, the doctor, a creche, uh, their own canteen. They had, you know, seminars teaching you how to eat healthily and you know, food and uh, I think, you know, shares in the company as well. It was a very, an excellent program of benefits and care around the people who worked at the factory, which is in a campus factory in Kornberg, just outside Frankfurt in Germany. And, um, um, and what was the thread? Tell me again, what were you asking? Yeah, the, the thread was kind of this idea that, you know, what Dieter Rams was working on and what Brown was producing was this fin finished final product. And yeah. yet it seems like the context of where these products were created was really advanced somehow. And it, I mean, I'm just imagining 1950s Germany and working in a place like this a production place that's really kind of based on social need and kind of this kind of utopian working place working conditions I just wonder if any of those kind of um, principles kind of moved into the way he saw products or the way he very worked. much very much so in that like Erwin said that um, you know a good product should be like a, you know a, a quiet butler who kind of stood in the corner and kept out of the way and but was there when you needed them um mm -hmm. it's kind of slightly an antiquated um <laughs> kind of example but it, yeah. it really makes sense that it was a good it, a good product should not sort of shout but it should be like totally reliable and totally there when you need it mm -hmm. needed it and um 
it was very that was very much the principle that they were designing for they were also very keen on this new kind of democratic design that they talked about something that was allowed the user the human user freedom that gave you freedom um that didn't restrict your movements that's the idea of it being their uh, Dieter's furniture that he started making with uh Vitsu in in around in the kind of right at the beginning of the 60s right in the middle of this booming design that was going on at brown that he was doing mm-hmm. um is is modular and you know it was a modular system he's he started making modular systems with with the brown stuff with especially with the hi-fis for example and um the whole that it all fitted together you know it all it was all components that could be taken apart put together this this shelving system that's behind me here um the 606 uh shelving system is it's designed for you to be able to keep it your whole life and if you move house you take it down reconfigure and make it fit into different shapes and spaces has, has that been the case with you <laughs> yeah although you know, i haven't moved i haven't moved since <laughs> been installed so um <laughs> uh, you have your 606 up it's hard to want to leave a place i think <laughs> yeah no i just it's, it's, yeah i, I mean it's interesting that you you know you said the democratic design kind of principles because i don't remember where i read it i don't know if it was in your book or where it was the cost of the products and how expensive yeah. they were oh, so it's kind of funny yeah. how the intention and the um you know the the reality you know what kind of it was very 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 expensive to make this kind of design very maybe also not the par- apple parallel and they're really expensive but yeah brown products were not cheap um this a brown stereo system cost as much as a medium sized family car if i understand wow. it was really expensive yeah. uh it too was very expensive So there was always I think it's something Adita always regretted that he wanted to make this accessible affordable furniture uh but it was like totally priced out you know out of the range of the of you know your average person That's also interesting when I think about the exhibition because you know we are comparing east and west German design and uh what's so interesting is that from the east so many of the products that we chose to exhibit won't be familiar to people who grew up in east germany because they were made primarily for export and i think i always you know i always just assume that everybody knows brown and everybody knows rams but it's not what you're saying kind of is it's not because they owned them because they were kind of out of reach for a lot of people it, it seems like people just couldn't afford them and so it was not an accessible kind of luxury but not nas you know in other ways it's yeah okay maybe it's also a pretty kind of white western middle class thing but it's you know a lot of people that i talk to um who especially who work in or since i made the book and started writing about uh ram saying oh i had the coffee machine or my dad had the razor or oh, yeah what with you know i actually also grew up with the alarm, you know the little alarm clock my dad yeah. bought me one when i think i was 12 and um i think i'm on my third one now that they've kind of broken which is not bad you know like <laughs> half, half a century of of the same brand like i don't think i it, waking up with that p- distinctive brown beep of of the brown alarm clock um sound design also really interesting um yeah. i can't imagine yeah. doing it really Yeah. No, I um I didn't grow up with any brown products, so I wasn't as fortunate, but uh and I still don't own anything. Um but it's so ubiquitous. I mean, I think everywhere you look, you know it, and you know it also from like you've mentioned a couple times, you know it from Apple products because you can just see the relation. I mean, it just it's so connected. Like for you everybody always talks about all of the innovations that that brown but specifically roms offered to the company you did you know you did a whole book on his work um like for you what's kind of the stuff that is the most innovative like what's for you the stuff that you or the aspects or the design kind of details that you always are shocked at how incredibly 
like maybe newfangled that was for the time or just like I think it really blew me away when I first started looking into uh, Dieter's team's work and 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 the brown and, and brown products. Uh, generally, when I, I think the thing that really amazed me was the was the the kind of evolution of the stereo systems and that a design team like Gujlo and Rams it kind of varies. The first ones to put a perspex lid on a record player. Yeah. Then the first ones to design, you know, that brushed silver stackable hi-fi systems. Yeah. That you probably did grow up with, or you know, that, that a lot of people had. Um, they came from Brown. Like his team designed them. They also did the first black hi-fi stackable systems. You know, the you know they moved from the brushed silver into the black systems in the in the seventies, and you know, with these all these kind of chunks and parts that you stack on top of each other. And that completely came from them. Nobody had done that before. The, so, like, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around that. Like, black stereo systems, like a black hardware. This, before this, nobody was doing this. Nope. Okay. That's pretty, that's pretty, that's kind of a big deal. I don't know. No, they completely came from them. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, really a lot of innovation going on. The way the knobs work, the dials work was very much picked up and taken on in, I think, you know, by other companies, different ways. They, they put in a most incredible amount of time to knobs and buttons. Um, very, very, another thing about detail, incredibly obsessive about details. Mm. Um, and that's why it was so good. You know, it would just, they'd spend ages on curves. I mean, yeah, what's like, uh, if you can say this, I mean, what's kind of his reputation with his colleagues for his, you know, because every designer I know is a bit of a perfectionist, <laughs> um, right? Like, uh, yeah. it'd be strange if they weren't somehow. But is he someone who was so nitpicky that, you know, like the team was just like, oh, here comes Dieter again, and he has this really specific thing, and or is it kind of like... He's treated I'm sure, as a god yeah. within... No, no, I'm sure it was. It was like, oh, God, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they fight. it was it was kind of, it was a bunch of guys. It was kind of an all-male team of, you know, battling away and arguing about this, that, and the other, and, you know, model making. And um, some bits he had very little to do with, other bits he was very involved in, especially the hi-fis was his favorite thing, and the, the Niso cameras kind of little super super eight cameras he was really fond of doing kitchen you you know kitchen machines not so much and um but i think generally it was agreed that he was right you know that or you know you're going out and change it i mean to be honest the only one of his team that i've really talked to at length is dietrich Lobs. Mm who um started pretty much as a kind of the intern and doing um product graphics so he's the one who designed the the clock dials and the the watch dials and the the, gra the graphics on the front of the stereo systems that on you know what was written mm. on, on the on the machines and um he 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 completely trusted Dieter. you know he was like nope he knows you know, yeah. yeah. There was, you know, a really sort of classic kind of quite lovely. I, relationship there. I, I guess, like um, you said, this kind of at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if this is verbatim what you said, but I guess the point is that you know, West or German design is is kind of synonymous with West German design, and um, and also with Dieter Rams, really, because if you go to any publication and you read. If you look, if you go to an, a publication about like, for example, the 1950s or post-war design, you go to the little part where it says Germany, and then the first chapter is Brown or Dieter Rams. What do you think has been the biggest part of like, or, or what do you, what would you say is the most important part of that legacy now? Like if we had to kind of segue to this moment now for German design, right? Like contemporary German designers, what are those things that you, you know, you have a lot of experience working in, in design writing and, and, and you work a lot with contemporary designers. And what do you think is something that has been the biggest inspiration think, to you know, them from him? 
quite honestly, this whole idea of German design is is completely outdated now. That's not, you know, it's something that could, you know, you can apply to the time period of your exhibition. But, you know, this, this kind of nationalism when it comes to design um, or architecture or making things of any kind, is it's just not really relevant. It's the way design mm. work, students work. It's a much, it's a hugely international thing mm. with lots of people traveling, lots of different influences coming from all different directions. So throw that German design thing straight out the window. Um, then maybe throw products out the window, this idea that design is products. Um, what's really interesting for me, the really interesting is, is the designers that are coming up that are thinking in terms of systems hmm. instead of products and seeing design objects as part of a system. Um, so actually, for example, strangely, he happens to be German, uh, but I would say, uh, Stefan Dietz is a very good example. He's, he's based down in Bavaria. Um, a very good example of how, um, he's taken Dieter's 10 principles and he's just written 10 more principles of uh, circular design or recommendations for circular design of this idea of, you know, what you take out has to go back and everything which has brought him to a new kind of design. He's just done a, a sofa for Magis and he's done, um, I can't remember the company, he's done this D2 system with Gonzalez Haas, which is basically, um, it's a shelving shelving system is basically just the fixtures that hold the shelf together mm -hmm. and that and the support and the idea is that the customers buy you know the fixtures and they go to a local carpenter who cuts to size whatever you know sh sheet shelving that you're going to have mm -hmm. and then um you know the company then helps you kind of guides you and advises you on how to put your own shelves together. So they're, mm. you know, they're just selling connectors. Right. Um, and that way is, is just, it's a completely different approach in terms of materials and reuse uh, that everything should be able, you should be able to take it apart to its component parts, recycling. Rams tried really hard. He was quite into, he went to the Aspen talks in the seventies um, I think you know, late sixties, early seventies. Listen to Buckminster Fuller and people like that talking. Um, probably Victor Popanek as well. Probably, you know, around the first time. Um, I think in Rachel Carson's book *Silent Spring* came out in sixty-two, nineteen sixty-two. Mm. She was telling the world that you know we're on a, you know, on a bad track, and um, he was very influenced by that this you know that, that we're killing the environment if we carry on like this uh i remember him telling me about how he wanted to introduce and now i don't know if it was with brown or with bitsu but how he wanted to introduce um a a recycling system within the company and bring back like get retrieve all broken finished products from customers and recycle them and was told that you know they couldn't it couldn't be done it was too complicated mm -hmm. and too difficult probably could do it now you know the logistics is there and companies are starting to do it you can send your stuff back to Bosch now for example Vitsu does it um, Vitsu sticks very much to his principles of um, you know about how to you know less but better you know living mm -hmm. with less but better and you know, Mark Adams, who runs Vitsu, tries to make his entire company, like Brown, is geared towards that whole, the social well-being of the people that work there, that make the products, the well-being of the user, the, um, the materials, the quality of the design. Everything is part of one huge, big system. And it's acknowledging that that system exists. Well, so I see that, you know, you, you live you with Dita Rams at home, at it's behind you with the shelf. If we, if you had to pick your one, I mean, you know all of the objects really well that he created, mm. the products, lines. Um, which of his designs would you say you couldn't really live without if you had to pick one? The shelving system. Yeah. I think uh, Jasper Morrison, I think, called it the, the end game of shelving systems. And... Um, in shelving and 
do you know I really hated it when when I first saw it I thought it was horribly masculine and um cold and I had I adore it <laughs> you know, yeah, I, can, I mean, I, I, we, we have it in the exhibition and I think and we, it doesn't have anything on it. So it's kind of like, mm -hmm. it, it's very sculptural looking on the wall with nothing. Uh, and when you pull it like this, it yeah. just, it disappears. You know, it's, what's, yeah. it's also, you know, it's exactly going back to what, you know, Erwin Brown's kind of aim was. It, it, it quietly does its job really, really well. Um, no, I, I, I have a great deal of love for this shelving system. <laughs> um, well, I just want to quickly show, this is going to be backwards for the people watching this, but on the screen, but here's your book. It's called Dieter Rams as Little Design as Possible. It was published in 2011, I believe. And um, now we're going to invite visitors or viewers to tune in to the film, which you, are also, you were also a part of, by the way. Yeah, um, by Gary didn't know. <laughs> so you appear in the film, and um, maybe you can just quickly, before we, we, we say goodbye, maybe you can quickly just share um, a memory from that experience of the film. Uh, yeah, that was, that was actually really lovely working with, with Gary. Uh, he called me in to interview Dieter in German, so off camera behind him, um, so that Dieter would be speaking in German. That was the idea. And then at the end of the days when we finished filming, he was like, oh, nah, so if just sit down there in the sofa and, you know, I'm just going to interview you. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, not, I'm behind camera and oh, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then, so I had no idea that I was in the film until I was actually sitting in the premiere in Frankfurt with Gary on one side and Dieter on the other side and kind of heard my voice coming through. I was like, oh. <laughs> killing himself laughing he was just sitting there watching me <laughs> waiting what did, what did Dieter Ram say about the film do you know he was very reluctant it was the same with the book he was like wow we don't, we don't need another book about me why are we doing this and then we said we could you know I convinced him I think Dieter like the young people need to know about your design principles and, the, you know, the same with the film. He's he's old, you know. He's, like, nearly 90. And people, he gets so harassed for interviews and stuff. And just, um, he just wanted to say everything that he needed to say in one place so that he could kind of be with his garden in peace and, and retire, basically. So, um I think Gary did that really, really beautifully. You know, it's 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 really lovely, quiet, gentle film. He captured Dieter really nicely. Uh, watch out for the scene in the you know in your vitra in the museum with him talking about the products. He's funny. He's he's really funny. You mean the the scene where he goes through and says talks about everything he doesn't like? Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's like, everyone thinks he's this really stern kind of tough dude but he's he's really funny too <laughs> that's so good to hear well thank you thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and and give us a personal look you know um on on Dieter I think I feel like I know him a bit better now having spoken to you about it and I invite everybody who's on here to tune in you can go to our YouTube page it's again uh design-museum.de slash YouTube, or you can basically just go to YouTube and type in Vitra Design Museum, and you can watch the film by Gary Huswit on Dieter Ram. So thank you so much to Sophie Lovell, and thank you for everybody for watching, and take care, and we'll see you soon. This music by Brian Eno. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's incredible music. That's so great. enjoy the music. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.